Hello and welcome to the sanctuary, a safe space to speak from the hearts. I'm your host, Israel, and my guest today is a really, really interesting person. I can't wait to talk to him. Dos, he's an airport firefighter, airport traffic controller, and he's an advocate for the homeless. Super awesome human being, my friend, Omar Deal. Thanks for coming to the sanctuary today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yo, okay, so I, I want to start with the firefighting thing. Like, how did that happen? How did you get into firefighting? So I was working as a as a residential court officer um, at a boys' home. So it's basically youth that get in trouble. They obviously can't go to prison, so they would get sent to the boys' home. Um, and I just applied. Actually, I don't remember the reason I applied for the job, but I applied. Went through the process, you know, successful at each step. And I remember I was in a training with my co-workers and I got the phone call right before going into the training to say that I've been selected. I think there were 200 and something applicants, maybe 300 applicants. And they wanted wow. me to let them know in 24 hours if I wanted the job or not. So I asked one of my co-workers, just happened to be next to me, hey, I got a job to be a fireman. What should I do? And she looked at me like I was like full blown crazy. She said, you better take that job. And I said, all right, I guess I'm taking the job. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that was how I ended up becoming a fireman. Not really planned, but and, yeah. Um, I, I'm curious, like, was the training involved? Because it's not just your average house fire. It's like right at the airport, airplanes, things like that. Yeah. So when I accepted the job, I didn't know I was going to be an airport fireman. However, the airport fireman training is considered specialist. So all firemen go through the same training. Um, to be an airport fireman, just like maybe to be a wildlands firefighter or to be, you know, a space firefighter or to be an oil rig firefighter, those are all specialist categories. So oh. once we done the basic training, which was just up at Pearson in Toronto Airport, um, we done the basic training and then we had a specialist, um, piece to it, which essentially an airplane is a house that can fly. Um, so the same principles up apply. I would say the one big difference is the amount of fuel that's on an airplane, you know, 50,000 pounds of fuel, et cetera, et cetera. So they say that obviously an airplane is, it can fly, right? It's a big metal thing in the sky so it's actually the skin of it is actually not that substantial so what they would teach us is that well one of the things an airplane can actually burn from inside out completely in 90 seconds uh. so that kind of increases your awareness and your, your understanding of why it's necessary to respond like quick fast and in a hurry yeah holy smokes well, so it puts another light to when they see, you know, if uh, if a plane crashes, like just leave everything and get out of the plane right leave now. Leave everything and get out. So it's it's a lot of practical things that I still use to this day. Um, one thing that I still do when I get on an airplane, when you get on the airplane, when you find an exit, count the rows between the exit and your seat. So I do that every time I get on an airplane, no matter what. Because we also have a exercise that we do where they have a, a plane and it they simulate what it would look like after a crash. So they fill it with smoke and all of the seats are kind of all over the place and the plane is like slightly on its side. So if you can imagine walking from one end of a plane to the other and it's just like chaos. So you literally have to use, well, the only sense you can use is your sense of touch because you can only see like this far in, in front of you. So little things like that kind of just wow. help you prepare for what might be, what could be. So we're just always training on eventualities and stuff like that. Wow. I mean, that's scary, but it also sounds really interesting though. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm curious, like you just, okay, so... Um, you know, I'll say, oh, uh, you know, the firefighting thing at that point is cool, but now I want to like be responsible for landing the planes too. How did you get to become an air traffic controller? So it was a little similar. So being an airport fireman means that we talk to air traffic control every single day. Um, so that means I would have learned the different taxiways. I would have learned the lingo and the jargon 
But then also we have our radio that just kind of listens into everything. So we can be aware of, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right. Let's get ready. So from listening to the radio, I was a airport fireman for just under five years. From listening to the radio every day, you kind of know what to expect. You know, okay, they're going to say this next, or they normally say this. So uh, a job became available and I saw it in the newspaper and I said, I can definitely do this. Like <laughs> without a doubt, I can, I can, I can do this. So I applied again, a couple hundred applicants and due to my experience as an airport fireman, it kind of set me above a lot of the candidates. So I was able to kind of, I guess, walk in the job. Um, I knew a lot of things about the airfield. I knew the lingo, I knew the jargon. So yeah, that, that was kind of a good segue to get me into air traffic control. Yeah, it's cool. Like I love, I love flying. I think, you know, it, it doesn't matter how many times I do fly every time the plane just lips up in the air. It's magical to me. It's like this heavy thing carrying hundreds and hundreds of people just like, boom, and, and it stays in the air for hours and hours and hours. But when it's coming down, like air traffic controllers, just they kind of have to, I, I, you know, I'm just guessing they have a, like a screen that displays where all the planes are. And they, so as an air traffic controller, what are some, some traits you should have like just as your personal your personal traits and then what are some things that kind of like sets air traffic controllers apart from the average person that's just walking at the airport i would say you definitely have to be calm under pressure without a doubt oh, yeah. um the training is very rigorous to where they push you beyond the limit that you're ever going to need to go to and what that does is that builds your confidence so to be an air traffic controller you must be confident because you're doing things that are, I mean, risky at the end of the day, and you have to be able to calculate that risk. No different from if you're on the highway and you're doing 120, right? It's a risk, but it's a calculated risk. What's the weather conditions? Are the police out? Um, are my tires bold? So you have to constantly assess things. And I would say one of the most difficult things that maybe you can teach, but maybe you can is the prioritization. So if you can imagine, like, let's say I have seven things going on. I have airplanes I'm talking to. I have firemen that I'm talking to. I have, um, you know, people in management positions that I'm talking to. And I have to constantly prioritize or who's important that I talk to next without forgetting. Because if I forget somebody, we've got a problem. So it's just always mm. keeping a, a, a running tally. And you have visual aids to help you, but always keeping a running tally of what's going on, what do I need to do next? And, um, you know, who have I already spoken to? It's just constant brain work. I'm always curious, like, is there any, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's got to be a reason, like, why the uh, um, the control tower, like, why, why it's where it's at and why it has windows all around? So I would say this as an education piece, there's actually multiple different types of air traffic controllers. Um, oh. So you have what you would normally see, that big, huge tower at the airport. Those are generally either aerodrome towers or approach towers. And they deal with what you would think they deal with. Um, planes who want to take off, planes who want to land, and planes who are moving along the airfield. So I was an aerodrome controller, which means my job was mainly visual. So, you know, 80, 90% of the things that I done, I done with my eyes. Um, you also have oh. something called an area controller. So basically each controller hands over to the next controller. So in Bermuda, for example, I would do three positions. Um, from those three positions, I would hand over to a uh, approach controller who would maybe do two different things. And that controller would hand over to an area controller who would do basically one thing. With area control centers, they actually have no windows traditionally. They generally are located far from airports, maybe in the middle of nowhere, but like I said, no windows whatsoever. Um, because everything they do is on a computer screen. So they have no need to see airplanes. Oh. Um, we actually... Even as it relates to an aerodrome controller compared to, let's say, an approach controller, there's sometimes conflicts because what we do is different. So what we understand is, is different. 
where they might think they need five miles of space and they have their spacing mm. perfect. They're amazing at their job. And they then give those planes to me with five miles of space. But I have to account for runway separation, which means when that plane lands, it slows down. So that five miles gets eaten up. As planes get closer to the runway, they also slow down. So the plane behind it catches up. So these are the things that I would have to account for and make sure that I can make space and make sure that I'm making sure that everybody is aware of what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's literally a lot going on, but it kind of becomes easy like anything else. You know, I don't know if you, if you're bilingual, right. But anybody who is bilingual, it's, it's a great example. People speak three and four languages with ease switch between them. Not a problem. Somebody who knows one language trying to learn a second. It's like rocket science, right? So that that's <laughs> yes. essentially <laughs> that's essentially what um, air traffic control is like. Once you learn that that language, so it's, it's a it's pretty easy, is what I would say. Does it? I mean, I guess does it take the wonder of flying? Because now you've done the like the fire uh, fighting part. Now you've done the like. Does it take the wonder out of flying for you? Because uh, I know what is happening and stuff. So I would say that, I mean, to start, I've been everywhere. I've been all over the world. I've, I've flew nonstop since as long as I can remember. When I became an airport fireman, I actually developed a little bit of anxiety around flying because I oh. knew a lot of the things that went into it. I knew the risks. I knew how ill the plane was. I mean, how often do you get on an airplane and think, I wonder how ill this plane is, you know? And what I would say is a lot of airplanes that everybody gets in one are probably older than them. And wow. like the, the, the thought that this is a 40 year old airplane, you know what I mean? Like, wait a minute, why is it still in the air? Or just the thought that, you know, so much, so much little pieces that I've developed a greater anxiety around, um, mm. you know, flying and even being an air traffic controller, it's, it's kind of no different understanding that mistakes can happen. You know, it's uh they they have a they have a model. It's called the Swiss cheese model, and if you if you look at a piece of Swiss cheese, there's little holes in it everywhere. All right. And yeah. Swiss cheese model says that when you get six pieces of Swiss cheese and they all line up perfectly, that's when you get your accidents because so much little things have to go wrong at the right time. But oftentimes, oh. with air traffic control, there are redundancies. There are things that are put in place. If there's a if there's a fire in engine number one, the pilot has a switch that he can flick and put out the fire. That switch might not work. There's also a backup switch to that. You know, there's also a whole host of things that are put in place. But things happen. You know, it could be miscommunication. You know, we're dealing with technology. Things happen, whether it's digital or analog. So there's a whole host of things that can go wrong. But what, what I will say is just like they always say, people say flying is safer than driving. So that's that's one thing to consider. Mm. Wow. Okay, so let's let's uh keep the fly on the side. One thing that I didn't even mention when I, I introduced you was that you do some farming too. Was it gardening? Uh but so there's the the farming part, but then there's also like where you are now, like <clears throat> seriously advocating for homeless people and there was a discussion we talked about which actually took me far from like kind of how you define a homeless person but let's start with the farm why did you decide to still start farming so when i got out of school i i i worked at a charity which dealt with autistic um people on the autism spectrum um, and for one of our team building exercises, they had us make this list and it was like a bucket list. It was probably around the time the movie Hangover came out. So we all made this bucket list of things we wanted to do. And one of my things on my bucket list, I found it maybe, I don't know, six or seven years ago. I actually found it or five or six years ago. And one of the things on my bucket list was I would like to live off the land. So I said, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of still want to do that, you know? Um, and for whatever reason, there was a opportunity to, um, take on a, a plot of land, about a third of an acre. And a friend sent it to me he said, Hey, you should apply. And I was like, 
Okay. So if you can kind of tell, you know, most of my opportunities and changes in life, although I want them, like from a universal point of view, I'm not necessarily consciously focused on attaining them. I'm just kind of living my life and through the universe, things kind of just fall into my lap, but I'm prepared, right? So mm. I've prepared myself and they fall into my lap and I kind of just take the opportunity. So he, he sent it to me. I wrote up a nice application. I told him who I am and what I want to do if they land and I got it, you know, and I would say I had zero equipment. I had zero materials. I had, you know, zero staff. Um, and I kind of just made it work, started small and just worked wow. my way up. And I, I still, to this day, I do it myself. I kind of asked some friends here and there to help me with some things, but I have a little tractor, I have tools, I have seeds. So I've got a bit of a system now where, you know, it's something that I do mainly for me, um, mainly to be self-sufficient. However, I, I do sell produce and I actually, this is actually, I guess, part of the reason why I got into helping homeless as part of my, you know, with, with, with growing on a larger scale than I was used to, which means I was harvesting a lot of crops, um, like more than I'm ever fathomed. You know, if you plant, I don't know, thinking about planting, normal people probably plant 10 seeds and I'm planting 5,000 seeds of one crop and a thousand seeds of another crop. And that's the easy part, you know, you plant them, but then when you realize, oh no, I have a 10,000 carrots. What am I going to do with 10,000 carrots? I can maybe sell, I don't know, tampons. I can sell five pounds, but 10,000. So I actually started giving away to charities. So I would find charities that I liked and hey, look, I have some food if you want it. And obviously they're going to accept it. So they were accepting it. And one of the charities was a place called Home, Home Charity. And in donating, I guess it made my name come up. And a friend of mine that works there, he messaged me, hey, we have this job coming up. I think you'd be great for it. Um, you know, here's my boss's number. Give her a call. I was like, okay, cool. Thanks. Not worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a okay. trailer. I like my job. Um, I'm farming. I have a lot of free time. No, thanks. Two weeks go by, you know, he messages me again. Look, we're interviewing for this position. I think you'd be great for it. Give my boss a call. So I said, you know what? All right, let me let me just give her a call. So I, I give her a call. Mm -hmm. We arrange an interview. Um, the day of the interview, I'm on my way in, and I pull up their annual report, and I go on their website, and I'm driving and, like, reading about them. Okay, this is what they do. Okay, cool. I got to the interview, and I smashed it. I answered all the questions right. I just really started to believe that I can definitely do this. I convinced myself in that interview that I can do this job. And in me doing that, it kind of convinced everybody else. So I don't know, a week or two later, um, I got a call for a second interview. They said, okay, Omar, thank you. You've been successful. Thank you for your time. Um, we're gonna send you a letter with an offer. I said, okay, perfect. I got the letter and it wasn't really what I was expecting. Um, so I, I sent her a message back and I said, um, is there any chance that maybe we can do a couple of things different? And she said, well, look, this is the offer. Um, let me know what you want to do. So I said, respectfully, um, I'm going to decline. I wish you guys all the best. And yeah, that's it. So I'm in my garden, maybe a month and a half later. I got a phone call. It's 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 the boss. Hey, Omar. So, would you be willing to do A, <laughs> B, and C? I said, Yeah, I, I I think that works for me. Yeah. So she said, Perfect. I'm sending over the contract right now. I said, You have it signed and back <laughs> to you by the end of the day. So you know, it it just worked beautifully. Where you know, one of the things I was looking for, the main thing that I was looking for was freedom. You know, um. Mm. freedom to live and i think a lot of times in life we work and we work so we can live you know i kind of right. wanted that balance to be i want to live and i want to work around my life not 
oh, I can't mm-hmm. because I have work. I don't ever want to have to say that. Um, just like, for example, in the start of this interview, I was outside, right? You said, hey, Omar, it's kind of windy. Can you go inside? So yeah, no problem. I was outside because I'm home, because I make my own schedule, because I'm able to dictate the terms of when I have meetings and, and when I'm available and when I'm, when I'm, I'm not. So that was a major sticking point mm. for me. And, and that encouraged me to have a transition from air traffic control, which is very structured, um, firefighting, again, very structured in the sense of you can't be a minute late, you can't be a minute early, don't think you could come to work drunk, um, you had, oh, you have a hangover, that's not going to work. So all of that structure, um, I kind of was tired of, and I was really ready for a bit of a break. And that doesn't mean that this is going to be my life forever, but, you know, I'm 36, I think, or 37, something like that. I'm going to check my birth certificate. Um, but, you know, I'm in my, I'm in my mid-30s, right? So this is the prime. Right. This is when we want to be enjoying ourselves, you know what I mean? Um, mm. And if, you know, I don't know, in two years, in one year, in 10 years, I decide that I want to be a traffic controller again, I still have that option because it's a, it's a license that you get for life once you can prove that you're medically fit. So I can kind of walk back into that um, at any point in time. I like that's one of those jobs. It's kind of like being a doctor or a medical pr- practitioner or an accountant. They're always going to need air traffic controllers, right? Yeah, so definitely. But something that came out of uh, you know, you talking about getting this job is like this um a different outlook to what a homeless person looks like. Do you want to share that? Yeah. So I'm basically. What I say, I actually had a speech last week where I had to talk to some donors. And what I said to them, I said, um, you know, homelessness doesn't look like what we see every day. And what I mean by that is whatever city you're from, whatever country you're from, whatever town you're from, there's a main street, there's a front street. And on that street, you see people who are, you know, begging, people who are drinking, people who look like grungy they might look like they're on drugs they might be on drugs they might have mental health issues they look crazy you know so we have this image of homelessness in our in our brains um homelessness is the person that we give a dollar to who wants to get a happy meal um but homelessness is actually so much more broad than that um and i should have done some homework for this for this interview but there's actually 13 subsections of homelessness Um, And just to cover some of them, the basics are people who are living in insecure housing. So that could be, you know, you might be 19 years old and your parent says, hey, you're 19, you got to go, right? Um, So you could be facing eviction. That could be your landlord wants to move somebody else in. That could be they're knocking down the building because they're going to build a new development. So people who are facing eviction are considered homeless. People who um, are in domestic issues, so if husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, um, and there's abuse going on. But if my name's on the lease and you're living with me, oh, where do you go? You know, maybe you can't afford a place by yourself. You are officially considered homeless. Um, there are a lot of my, not a lot, but I have, I have clients currently who work regular jobs. Monday to Friday, nine to five, um, and they cannot afford anywhere to live. And they actually either live in a variety of different situations, but um, some might be, if you could imagine, a pump room. So you can't live in my house, but I have somewhere in my shed where you can live. People living in sheds are considered homeless. So you might never see this person on the street because they go to work and they come to their home which is somewhere that they shouldn't be living. It doesn't have running water. It doesn't have a bathroom, doesn't have a kitchen, maybe just a little place for them to stay. Um, and the list goes on and on. You also have people who are due to be released from prison who are considered homeless because where does somebody who's getting out of prison go? I mean, mm. obviously we know there are halfway houses and, and stuff like that. Um, But that doesn't apply for everybody. And I think we see on TV a lot, people get out of jail and there's a car with all your friends waiting for you (laughs) and they have 
a bottle of alcohol and some and some but that's not reality that 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 is mm. far from reality so we have people due to the release of institutions that could be mental institutions you know that could be drug treatment institutions how do these persons find a home and in a lot of cases there's no structure to assist with that um in a lot of cases in the developed world especially um you are only helped once you hit rock bottom so what we do at what you know what, what what we do at home is we try and number one prevent homelessness right but we also um are on a mission to end homelessness and i just covered some of the different types again i should have done my homework but there are 13 official subsections of, of homelessness um and it looks very different for a lot of different people yeah i remember you telling me you know a, a version of this and it, it kind of blew my mind because yes the average person was the average person would think hey you know what um it's the person that comes you know to your car window to ask for money or for food Th that's kind of where your mind goes to or someone that is actually not at home but when you think based on these things you've shared it's like oh my god you know what yeah that makes sense and so what are some of the things that you do at home to help uh help these people out i'm going to give you one more quick example because i think it's really relevant so if are you aware are you familiar with the the wind rush generation this is a this is what have been a phenomenon that happened in england oh like in england the, the like the people that live there and then basically they're not from so they're like immigrants but mm -hmm. they don't have like say their permanent residency mm -hmm. so they're like hey you have to go back to like yes. where you were born and stuff yes. but they're not really from that country anymore no. you know no yeah so you know that would be a great example of homelessness where if you are being deported for any reason from a country that you've lived your whole life maybe to a country that may be on your passport or your birth certificate but you maybe never lived there in your life what do you do when you land in this foreign land when you land in Jamaica, when you land in Nigeria, when you land in, you know, Colombia, what do you do? You are now homeless. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do at home, we do a couple of different things. We've got a couple of different programs. Um, the, the, the broadest aspect of all of that is we offer case management services. So me, I am a case manager um, and I am basically just connecting people to services. And just if you can imagine some of the... Like, Based on some of the examples that I gave, you know, I have clients mm -hmm. um, mental health, uh, drugs, domestic abuse, um, childhood abuse. So what that looks like is I was actually having a conversation yesterday. A large portion of my clients have experienced childhood trauma when they were a child. So if you could imagine a four-year-old man, a 20-year-old woman, a 70-year-old man, et cetera, et cetera, all of these people most likely are directly facing troubles today because of childhood trauma, physical, sexual, e emotional abuse as a, as a child. Um, so that's a huge part of it. So if a client like that, we are arranging therapy sessions, mm trying to get them the support that they need to actually heal. Um, but in addition to that, from a case manager, from a broad point of view, we, we do something that's called housing first. And housing first, it's not traditional. Housing first means I don't care what's wrong with you. I'm going to put a roof over your head. Then I'm going to try to fix what's wrong with you. Right. Most other programs, they say, Oh, you do drugs. Get off the drugs and then I'll help you. Or they say, mm. Oh, you have mental health problems. We we don't we don't help we don't help people like that. You you have to go get that some, sorted out somewhere else. Or they say, Oh, criminal racket violence. Oh no, 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 no. Not in our little nice facility that we have here. Um, so what we do is we accept everybody and we house them. And we have an eight week program where we try and sort out all of those issues that they might be going, going through, um, in addition to trying to mm. get them the supports that they need to independently house themselves, which might be cooking, cleaning, 
It might be hoarding. It might be jobs. It might be a resume, passport, ID, license. Literally nothing is off limits. Um, but like I said, housing wow. first is, is what I would say is the most amazing thing about what we do. Um, Cause you know, when you think of that, I don't know, is I think Maslow's whatever, you know, the triangle hierarchy. You wanna needs, get yeah. your food. Yeah, exactly. Like your food, your housing. That's kind of where it's so it's like when you think of it, it makes sense that you're taking that approach. Cause like when the person sees that you see them as a human being and you're treating them like this, it makes doing that work a little bit easier for them, you know, because Yes. They see that, okay, there's value being placed on me. I'm being treated differently versus being judged or whatever, you know? So, so currently, so like I said, we have an eight week program. So I am currently leading the facility that does that. We call it Black Circle. Um, so if you can imagine, well, not if you can imagine, I'm going to explain it to you. So what we do is for eight weeks, I select, not me alone, but I am part of the selection process to picking eight guys and these eight guys come from all different backgrounds, all different subsections. Um, so one of the things that I say to the guys when they come in, and mind you, sidebar, we don't just house men. If, if women present themselves, then we also house women. However, we find that there are a lot more supports out there for women. Um, so going back, you know, for, the, for those eight individuals, what we will do is, or what I will say is, I would ask them, what is your biggest burden right now? Most times they will say, well, I'm homeless, housing. And I will say, I'm going to remove that burden from you, right? And in doing that, I want to free you to be able to be motivated enough to go and get the things that you need. And I say, here's my number. You have my email. I'm her on a daily basis. Um, I work for you because what we find is that Motivation is the determining factor for somebody's success. We are not a program that says, um, I'm kicking you out or, oh, no, you didn't do this. We are a program that says whatever you need to get there, we're going to help you. Um, and if, if you are doing your part, we're going to do our part. And if I fail in doing my part, I'm still going to take care of you. Some way, shape, mm. or form, we're going to figure it out. So we have... Thankfully, luckily, <laughs> my um, executive director has given me and our team the autonomy to get the job done, which in a lot of organizations, mm. that doesn't happen. There's, there's micromanagement, there's, there's structure and rules, and oh, no, 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 we can't do it that way because and we're like, well, why can't we do it this way? It works this way. Oh, no, 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 that's not how I was taught. So none of that <laughs> happens. You know, it's, it's complete freedom to get the job done. And, you know, mm. in taking that burden off of these guys, it, it really creates a good vibe in the house, you know, and what, what I would love to see is other programs adopt this mindset. If I, you know, I've, I've actually only been working here for a year, a year in a week, actually, with my one year anniversary in one week. Um, oh, nice. And if <laughs> I, thank you, if I explain to you or told you about the types of people types of people who we've had in our program you would be like him what no way <gasps> um but it's been successful you know i think we since i've been here we have not had a physical altercation in house wow um and 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 that alone as a statistic so you know shelters are known for drugs and violence and because what we do is our name, home, we kind of show that. And I would love to give you a tour. One day I actually will give you a tour. Um, but we are a home. You know, you can come and go as you please. We have Wi-Fi. We have Netflix. We have YouTube. We have um, a full kitchen. We have an in-house chef. Um, our chef was actually a formerly homeless person. Um, he now obviously works for us. Wow. And he lives with us. So... Another part of our program is as guys are coming through, we try and identify talent. And if we can use you, we are going to employ you. 
And even if you are not fully employable, we are still going to give you a chance to, hey, can you do the laundry? We're going to pay you whatever the minimum wage is to go do laundry. Or we're going to pay you to do other little odds and ends. Because at the end of the day, our goal is very ambitious to end homelessness. But in order to do that, it means we can't just leave somebody behind. We can't just say, oh, no, I'm not going to help you. Because now you're still homeless and you still have to be helped. And that is our mission to help you. So it's it's a lot more ownership in individual success and failure compared to other organizations. They have no problem kicking you out if you break the rules. We're going to work with you, you know, and we do have some rules, you know, we do have some rules, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good program. It, it's, you have to see it to believe it. Mm, housing first. I love that. I mean, you know, you've lived this really, really interesting life, done all these really amazing things, and now you are not just giving your uh, your harvest from your garden, and, um, but you are actually here influencing lives daily with what you do. So I'm wondering, like, when you are doing all these things, right, what are some things that you do for yourself to, like, relax? Because... You know, it's 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 like uh, being a case manager, and, and I know it's housing first, and you have supports and your team, but it still seems like it's a really you know it's, it can it seems I might be wrong here, but I think there's some stress involved in dealing with some of the people that you have to work with. Um, so I'm wondering when you do all these things that you do, what are some things that you do for yourself to relax? Um, I think in the first instance. Uh, the flexibility that I do have to work um, relieves a lot of distress. You know, if it's, I don't know, a Monday morning, you look outside, it's raining, you still have to go to work. If you look outside, mm. it's a snowstorm, you still have to go to work. You have to commute. Mm. You have to fight traffic. Before you even get into the office, you're stressed. When I look, in, mm. when I look outside in those similar situations, I say, I'm going to go for a run this morning. Or I say, mm, I think I'll work from home today. So the freedom to, to move when you want to move, release, is a, is a, a, a stress reliever all in its own. Um, outside of that, you know, I try to go for runs. I try to go to the gym. Um, I done a little boxing in my, in my day. So I try and sharpen up my skills. I would say outside of that, I, I'm I'm just enjoying being able to give. Um, there's actually a story that I like to tell, a quote um, from somebody named DMX. Everybody knows DMX. Well, most people know DMX. Y'all go make me lose my, you know, DMX, wild oh, guy, dear. pit bulls, um, ATVs, scramblers, mean looking. He has a quote. And he says, this is a video crew. If anybody watching your show can find this crew and send me this, I will be grateful beyond measure because I haven't been able to find it. Um, but mm -hmm. I did see when he said it, he said, most people, this is not verbatim, but most people don't understand life. Um, most people don't realize that the most selfish thing that any individual can do is to be unselfish. The most selfish thing that anybody can do is to be unselfish. He goes on to say, you have people who are trying to hoard and they're being selfish. They want all the wealth. They want all the money. They want all the power. If they, if they found a new song, they don't want to tell you where they got it from. Remember those days where you would download music and you didn't want to tell anybody where you got it from? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so... You have people trying to be selfish, and he says, those people trying to be selfish, they're blocking more things from coming because they're already full. Their cup's full. They can't, they can't let anything else in because there's no room. He says, the people who, when they get things, whether that be blessings, if you're you know, um, spiritual or anything like that, or the people who are, who are receiving abundance in any form, money, um, family, health, 
the people who are now giving of that to others, those are the people who continue to receive. So that's why he says, the more unselfish you are, as in the more you give, the more you get. And and I, I couldn't agree with that more in the sense that, how to put it? There is a chemical in your brain. You learn about this in high school, right? It's beta endorphins. They, I remember learning about it. They, they say that when you do good things for people, a chemical gets released. You know, it's called beta endorphins. It makes you feel good. So if you could imagine, I'm doing this job, right? I'm helping people. I'm helping people who, as far as I'm concerned, are no different from me. No different from you. Mm. And in helping people, it's my job, right? But in helping people, mm. in genuinely helping people, that chemical has to be on overdrive, right? Because I know I'm doing something good and I know I'm actually affecting somebody's life. Yes. I can't put a price on that chemical, you know? Mm -hmm. That is intangible. And then, if again, depending on your belief systems, what is the spiritual karma that I'm getting from doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, what is, this is just inviting abundance into my life because I'm just giving to people. People have a need and I'm satisfying it in one way or another. So, you know, we talk about stress and things like that. I would say what I do is inherently a protective factor for stress. Mm -hmm. No, oh. that's not to say that there is no burnout in my jaw, but I, I want to say that one more time for you because I think you liked it. <laughs> what I do is inherently a protective factor for stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm on call sometimes and I do have to turn off my phone from time to time. So, you know, I do need to protect myself and we do have a team of staff and sometimes somebody else picks up the mantle and sometimes somebody else, you know, takes the lead. So rotation is important and teamwork is important, but, you know, so far I've been able to successfully manage the stress in my job because that's the freedom that we've been given to kind of just get the job done. Well. Wow. Omar, it's always brilliant talking to you. Uh, I learned so much, and I'm going to make sure I count my seat from the from the exit <laughs> door. <laughs> but um, um, I'm going to let you go with this one, though. Uh, with all these things you do, uh, what advice would you give to people out there uh, when they are thinking of, like, the homeless or, or, or like this change you've dropped with the audience today with what a homeless person is, what advice can you share? I would say this is something that I think is, is, is worth telling. So 2024, this is the, there's a pronouns are important in 2024, right? What do you go by? I think I see you have he, they, right? People want people to respect people's pronouns. Um, so I would take it further back and I would say, I try and view everybody as I. Treat them how you or I would like to be treated. And I think that when you view people as part of you, not as separate, not as he or they or them or she, or black or white or American or Canadian, when you look at others the same way you look at yourself and you realize there is no disconnect, literally there is no disconnect. We are made up of the same things as the frogs, as, as the planets, we're all the same things. You will begin to, I, I believe you will begin to see life different and life will begin to see you different. Um, if you, if we as a people continue to have these separations, um, it makes it difficult. That's what creates friction. Um, there is a, there is a book that I have, um, Hermetic Principles. One of the principles, it talks about separation of things in layman's terms. So what's the difference between on a thermometer between hot and cool? 
uh i guess the scales so we are the same in nature just different in degree that's all. yeah degree yeah it's just a degree you know exact same thing so treat each other like you are no different from me uh, men and women we're just alike you know men and boys girls and women what's the real difference there is none you know what's the saying love love means if you love yourself you should love everything you should love everybody so i would say if you just treat from a homelessness perspective or any other perspective i i and i and and what i would say that's a that's like a rasta principle you know what i mean um and these things i think have come full circle because this has been a belief system for you know i would say maybe hundreds of years if not more um but those principles of i and i and i are what really can help the world and help people get through their day no need to be angry at somebody else ask yourself well what why am i angry it's not because of what somebody else done it, it starts here you know so that's the abstract advice that i would i would have for anybody listening is well, I Omar, it all starts with I. Thank you so much. I and I seeing everyone like I see myself. That's something to really, really reflect on. Um, thank you so much for all the amazing things you do with home, uh, your your garden, and and just everything in general. And thank you so much for coming to the sanctuary today. Thank you for having me. Really, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.